Dear Heavenly Father, we ask for your presence with us today. Lord, I ask for your Holy Spirit. May I present the, this uh, presentation in a manner which is clear and pleasing to you. May it be truthful, Father, knowing that I have to give account for if there's anything that I say here that is um, incorrect, Father, uh, or dishonest. Lord, I seek to be truthful. I seek to be what uh, you've laid on my heart, what I believe you've laid on my heart to, to say today. And Father, uh, I pray that those watching can be blessed by this presentation and consider the topic and the, the issues that I'm bringing up. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the topic today I've entitled The Jenga Block That the Builders Rejected. And I, I use this here title because uh, Sister Tess, or Tess, um, made a presentation in Australia that um, used the Jenga block. Uh, it's a board game, or no, it's not really a board game. Well, it's a game that uh, you have all these here blocks, and you build a tower, and um, you're supposed to take a block, one person takes a block out, another takes the blocks out, and uh, whenever the tower falls, then that person loses. And that, I think that's the way uh, the game works. And uh, Tess used this here as a, an illustration for the Midnight Cry message. She says that this here uh, Jenga tower of the Midnight Cry you know, it's one complete package. You can't start taking out blocks, and it's going to eventually just going to topple. And uh, she was directing this accusation to FFA uh, with uh, what she accused FFA of taking out these blocks, and, and this the whole midnight cry message was then going to be uh, obsolete and without purpose if you start taking out blocks. Uh, <clears throat> my purpose of this here presentation is not so much to to try and take out blocks, but more to identify a block which she the that hasn't been added to that Jenga tower, to that midnight cry message, and uh, I've tied it in with what uh, Matthew twenty one verse forty two says. Uh, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. So I'm, I'm saying that there's a, a stone or a Jenga block that has been rejected, and it's the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Let us turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. And this is a, a similar um, context uh, to this passage that I just read in Matthew. First Peter chapter two. Do not say two. It says two Peter here. Yeah. Sorry, first uh, Peter. That's a, a mistake. Sorry. It says wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocr hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And the, the message uh, of part of this here block is uh, something that you taste as well. It's um, a sweet message. It's connected with honey. So with that, I'm just saying that that there is, connects with this um, presentation. Verse 4, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. 
ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which, is, which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offence, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. So not only is it relating to something that uh, you taste, uh, it's relating to the priesthood. There's a stone here that relates to the priests and it's being rejected. And uh, I'm saying that that's the context that I'm, I'm putting this here stone. And uh, I have here, this is my illustration of the Jenga block. And I'd say Acts 27, I'm happy to have that there as part of the foundation of the Midnight Cry message. But I also have Ezekiel chapter 4 as part of the Midnight Cry message. Ezekiel chapter 4 gives us a 390 and a 40 days where Ezekiel's lying on the side. And he begins on the 21st of July um, in 592 BC. And 390 days later, it takes us to the 15th of August in the year 591 BC, which is a date um, well, the, the 15th of August, we can certainly relate to the 15th of August of the Midnight Cry message of Samuel Snow. So, um, there's no other person in the Bible, I believe, that exemplifies uh, Samuel Snow than Ezekiel. He starts his prophecy in the, in the fifth day of the fourth month, as uh, Samuel Snow did in Boston on the 21st of July. He then goes on to present two presentations, one on the 14th and one on the 15th in the Exeter camp meeting. And he, he's, his, pro, his uh, prediction uh, concerning the close of probation on the 22nd of October is based on uh, a year-day principle, which was added to the, that movement, was added to that movement by Josiah Litch, and that was a 381-year and 15-day prophecy. <clears throat> and so Ezekiel himself, he's also connected with his with this prophecy of 390 and a 40-year uh, prophecy. Uh, there is an indirect 391 and a half-year prophecy, and that there uh, is also is connected to the history of Jeroboam where there's a prophecy concerning another Josiah, the King Josiah. And um, to me, this is all being interconnected, that this is uh, so much part of the Midnight Cry message. And uh, there's no other place in the Bible I could point to where there's going to be such uh, symbology of the Midnight Cry <coughs> in these passages. The, one, the passage where Jeroboam is uh, rejecting the prophecy of Josiah um, is the 15th day of the 8th month, which we can take symbolically to be the 15th day of August. And, uh, but this here, to me, it's, it's quite clear that this is uh, midnight cry terminology, but this is not, this is their tower that they're building. There's probably some good information that the Perminder and Tess are, are building onto this here. But there's a, I'm saying this here block of Ezekiel 4, it, it's, it's not part of their message. They're not going to fulfill the part of uh, Ezekiel, who's typifying Samuel Snow and giving a 
um, and a half year prophecy which is, relates to the destruction of Jerusalem, which relates to Islam, because we can connect that to the 391 years and five, sorry, 15 days of uh, Josiah Litch. So we've really understood in this year movement since 2014, we've connected uh, the midnight cry to uh, an act of Islam, which uh, in a sense cripples the United States, which we can say we can see being typified by the destruction of Jerusalem. So, if, if you're going to be part of the midnight cry message at the end of the world, this is prime um, midnight cry territory. It's biblical based. Uh, we're not going out. We're not going to have. Um, we're not having histories of non-biblical um, figures being exalted over this prime uh, midnight cry passage and uh, it's, it's a stone that they've rejected it's not there they're not going to be fulfilling that message and uh, and i hope that that there will be a p people i believe that god is going to is raising up now people who will fulfill this role Amen. Amen. <clears throat> um so part of the, the Acts 27 message is something that also ties in to Ezekiel 4. You have uh, Eurotliden, uh, a storm that takes us to the 14th night, which the 14th night is, relates to, we can relate to the 14th of August. It's, uh, it leads to Malta, it leads to honey. Honey is, uh, is what Malta means. We have there, there also a 2520 uh, connected. You can see that there in the, the measuring of the fathoms. Uh, there's 20 fathoms and a, a 15 fathoms, and you can connect them to, if you're going to connect, count them both into inches, <coughs> there's a 2520 there. But that there is divided up into uh, 1440 inches and 1080 inches. And 1080 inches is, relates to the image of the beast. In Daniel chapter 3, which was 60 cubits. So 1080 inches is 60 cubits. So the Eurogladon will take us to the image of the beast test as well. On 1440, uh, I can connect that to the 144,000, or we can say that the 144,000 is really the two tribes um, where Judah. It's, uh, in the, uh, Revelation chapter 7 connects to 144,000. It mentions the 12 tribes of, um, of Israel. So we can see there's even maybe a connection there to the joining of the two sticks. Yesterday, I, uh, or not yesterday, on, I'd done a presentation two days ago where I had 777 days and it was divided up into 252 and 525. And I sort of related that to the pattern of the seven, la the, seven, the seven years of famine in the time of Joseph, where he had two years of uh, famine where, where Joseph was separate from his brothers and Jacob. And then there was the last five years uh, where they were uh, together. So you could maybe mark this year point, which we lined up with the 18th of July, uh, 2020, as part of the, uh, the midnight cry message and also um, where the, the joining of the two sticks, this is 100, 144,000, it's the 12 tribes being joined together there. And we can line up your Euroclidon, then if at the end of that, if there's going to be honey, that we can find out there also in the prophecy of Josiah Litch, where he has a 391 year and half a month prophecy, which uh, leads to honey. And that's, you can find that in Revelation 9 and, and 10. It talks about that history in 1840. When 10, Revelation 10, verses 9 and 10. <coughs> and you can also even tie in there, I didn't put it up here, but um, the 11th of August, you can maybe take that as being an, an, a numeric symbolism as 118. And you can connect that to the first day of the first month, to the first day of the fifth month. There's 118 
days in that period. So you can even you tie in to here uh, at the midnight the Josiah Letcher's prophecy ending also at the midnight cry in that context. And then we have Ezekiel. He has an indirect, indirect 381 year and half a year prophecy. And that leads to Ezekiel. Uh, and that also is, there's a message of honey also you find in Ezekiel verses 3, verse 3. He eats, um, he eats a, a scroll, which is to him sweetness. So that, just the symbology. So I've watched Perminder for years. I've been uh, impressed by a lot of his teaching. And um, I'm just, um, I don't understand why he doesn't see this as part of the, the Midnight Cry message. I just think it's, there's something wrong. And uh, I, I don't understand why they're, they're even just so much against it. Um, if, we, if you have your notes, Um, just go down, there's a, on the first page, just talk about the wheels within wheels. And it is in midnight uh, that Ezekiel 1 1 places us, and then there's a vision of wheels within wheels. So, this, if, it's, if we're going to apply that to Raphia, um, we can, and it, which is uh, after a, a 30 year period, we're noticing from 1989 to 2019. In Ezekiel 1, verses 1, it talks about the 30th year. So we can tie that in with our history now. It says, The wheel within wheels represented in this symbol was confusion to the finite eye, but a hand of infinite wisdom was revealed amid the wheels. But perfect order is brought out of confusion. Every wheel works in its right place in perfect harmony with the other part of the machinery. Uh, I, certainly since the, the camp meeting in Germany, I think for myself personally has been a time of confusion. I've been pretty much confused by the rejection, the rejection of this here block, um, <coughs> that Perminder and, and Tess and the others in the leadership have um, rejected. And, um, but I'm there's also hope here and it says that amid the wheels, perfect order is brought out of the confusion. And I believe God is going to make things plain. And since I've been here, he's um, been certainly working with me and, and bringing more things to, into clarity. Uh, in that history, there's a couple of times El Mike mentions this here, wheels within wheels. And it's, <coughs> I think there's a, she, it seems to be related to people desiring too much power. She goes on to say, I have been shown that human beings desire too much power. They desire to control. And the Lord God, the mighty worker, is left out of their work. The workmen feel qualified to hold the highest place. Let no man attempt to manage that work which should be left in the hands of the great I am. And who in his own way planning how that work shall be done. Know that God is the instructor of his servants and he will work through whom he will. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> to me, that speaks to our history. We, I, I believe there's uh, <clears throat> people desiring too much, desire, desiring to control, <clears throat> desiring to, to throw out <clears throat> this here uh, Ezekiel block without even giving uh, evidence as to why it is, calling it fanatical, a false prophecy without even providing evidence as to why it is a false prophecy. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> if you go down to the second page, um, there's a, it says, starts with Luther, and this is a, a quote from the Great Controversy 19, sorry, 1888, page 135, paragraph 2. It says, Luther, in reply, expressed his regard for the church, his desire for the truth, his readiness to answer all objections to what he had taught and to submit his doctrines to the decision of certain leading universities. But at the same time, he protested against the cardinal's course in requiring him to retract without having proved him an error. The response was, recant, recant. Um, when, uh, 
uh, when I was in Germany, um, I have been um, trying to to share the message of uh, Ezekiel 4 and the, the two 381 and a half year uh, connected with the name Josiah um, <clears throat> a study that uh, transpired here last uh, August or last autumn, sorry. And uh, I was um, myself and Adelio and another brother from um, Holland. We had a meeting and um, generally it was pretty intimidating and um, we weren't asked to, there was no real evidence put forward as to what, why we were teaching was fanatical, what, what, was, uh, what was wrong with our teaching, what was, um, uh, why was it uh, considered a false prophecy. Rather it was just recant, recant. Um, at the time, I, I made a, a parallel to what happened with Perminder uh, in 2012. I, I recognised that he had made a time prediction that he then, um, when he presented it, um, and it was considered fanatical, that he uh, let, then let it go. At the time, anyway, he said he, he let it go, but then it later became acknowledged. I also made this here parallel with uh, this here prophecy of the study of Ezekiel 4, and I uh, said, okay, I, I recognize them as the leadership. Uh, it was a time prediction, it was being considered as fanatical, and I, uh, I, I accepted them as the, as the leadership of the movement and I said that I would um, uh, no longer agitate it. Uh, to me, I think I was, I was in a position where, um, you know, God's in charge here. If, if he's going to, if he wants it to be presented, he'll, he'll make it, he'll, he'll hold them to uh, accountable to their decision. And um, I said, I've, I've done my part, you know, that, that's okay, I'm happy enough to let it go. Uh, when I made this here statement, uh, Tess, who had been pretty much quiet up to that there point, um, and, and, and was seemed to be offended by my comparison, and uh, said that comparison. my comparison, oh, <coughs> comparing uh, this here, the prophecy of Ezekiel, the three nine ones and Josiah, to what Permender uh, had. Uh, predicted in 2012 about the Sunday law in 2014 and um, she, she then made a comment that I, in making this comparison I then was seen to be okay and then I, I like twist it I, I twisted it and um, to me I, I was just uh, making a plain comparison but when she said I, I twisted it it was very much as if I had some evil intent uh, and like I was deliberately trying to, to twist things and uh, after that there I, I was kind of very much exasperated. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't really trying to have any uh, purposeful um, sort of intent to try and make them uh, to, to twist things. I was just trying to be a, a, give an honest account. Uh, it's kind of it took me very much uh, uh, by surprise, I, I, I sort of, uh, I didn't fight against it, I just sort of, okay, I, I tried to make, to make some, uh, okay, maybe it's not comparable. But after that there, I just, there was a lot of alarm bells going on, uh, just the, the atmosphere for me in that camp meeting afterwards, I, was, I just felt very cautious, and I just didn't, I just, uh, I didn't really um, sense uh, God's peace about the place. There was maybe light and power, but there was no love, joy, peace for me there uh, amidst it. And um, and then after that there, camp meeting, I just, my plan was just to come back. Uh, I don't know, I didn't seem to be able to contribute anymore to the, me to the, to, to the message. And um, I just thought, I'll just come back, do, do my own thing, and uh, just let the Lord make the way plain. 
and uh, I wasn't uh, planning to be here. I was, you know, was, this is something I there was I understood, after the, the split with FFA. Um, I was generally just I was observing the arguments, but I wasn't really getting involved in the chats and whatever, to, and uh, maybe just the odd small thing, but nothing um, trying to influence either way. And then I just I believe the Lord was making things plain. I just when, the, when Jeff invited me here, I just sensed that um, that this, the way this is your message, that uh, the, the builders have rejected, that this is. The Lord is, is planning to to put this here block uh, in its place. That the foundation is is going to be. He's putting the foundation together again with Acts twenty seven and, and other passages. I just like to to talk about uh, a wee bit of the history of the Millerites and, and our history concerning the midnight cry. There's a, in the history of the Millerites, there's generally key, I'm trying to think of the, the key passages, there's maybe more, but that was foundational in, like, uh, in William Miller's message. We think of Daniel 8:14, uh, the 2,300 days, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, that the hour of the judgment has come. It was pretty much the key passages, correct me if I'm wrong, in, in that history. <coughs> Following the first disappointment, you have Habakkuk, uh, the, uh, the, the tarring time, also Ezekiel uh, chapter 12. Ellen White mentions that there in Great Controversy. Uh, before out there history, you had Revelation 9.15, and the Josiah Lich prophecy, which confirmed the year day principle and, and gave impetus to that movement. You have the, maybe the, you, you would have the, the scriptures relating to the Day of Atonement and Leviticus 23 would, be, would have been maybe a key passage around that their time as well. Um, following uh, the tar- in the tarring time then when the, the, the midnight cry came, there's passages such as Revelation 14 it would have been a key passage that had been recognizing that the Protestant churches were then Babylon. Ezra 7.9 was another key passage that seen the, the decree take effect in 457 BC in the autumn. And that was uh, influenced Samuel Snow uh, when he gave the Midnight Cry message there. And then the parable of the ten virgins was uh, a key passage. Uh, they understood that they were fulfilling this here parable. And I'm saying that Ezra 7.9 this, this is the Midnight Cry message, and this is really became part of our Midnight Cry message uh, beginning in the March 2013. I kind of liken it, if you're standing in 1844 and you're standing your snow and you're, you're, you've got like a, a fishing rod and you've got a hook on it, and you're casting that there hook into the future, and it's landing in March 2013 here at FFA, and the Ezra 7-9 is being opened up and we're understanding that Samuel Snow has been typified by Ezra, but not only, or even, even the Millerite movement, but, uh, but also we're seeing more Ezekiel being tied into this here. We, we came to understand that uh, Ezekiel 1.1 1, 1 is the fifth day of the fourth month. We understand that the passage in Desire Ages Midway uh, relates to... Um, Samuel Snow and the Midnight Cry message beginning in Boston and it connects Ezekiel to that so Ezekiel is therefore symbolizing uh, Samuel Snow uh, we've also in our history Acts 27 uh, where tests uh, we presented the number uh, 273 was a significant number in that there time and uh, we see 273 I think we're pretty much I'm pretty much accepting uh, the midnight cry of Tess there, but it's not so much she see, she, she has accused those now who've uh, who accept, who accepted that their message at the time that they didn't really accept it, but have uh, are now separating from them and they're now rejecting it. But I, I think it's more rejecting what has um, occurred since that their time. Um, we can see that the 
two no, uh, reckon we recognize the number 273 as being significant. Uh, if you, we can tie that in with uh, the, the year 742 BC, we find that there's 2,730 2, years then to 1989. And we understand 273 was... Uh, um, was part of Tess's message and we, that was described as the message of the North and we have here in 1989 um, the, the King of the North coming against the King of the South with chariot ships and, and many horsemen and we have uh, in Daniel 11 verse 40 and we have 273 is connected with the idea of conception and, and birth of a child it's uh, normally about 273 days but um, uh, a child is then uh, growing in the womb and then before its birth. So you can connect 273 there and line that up, up with conception and a birth in 1989. We, we recognize this movement has uh, been born. Uh, uh, so other passages, um, well this is more the, relating to the midnight cry message for our time. Um, there is passages which can be more related to William Miller's message and the tarrying time, <coughs> Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45, Revelation 14, just the three angels' messages, uh, passages concerning 9-11, Leviticus 26 then, um, being significant after 9-11. It should be on the top too. <coughs> Leviticus 26. Yes, yeah, so yeah, okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so Leviticus 26 uh, was pretty much part of that message as well. Thank you. And... Um, so I'm connecting this. These are key passages. Acts 27, 1 Kings uh, 12 and 13 relate to the prophecy of Josiah. 2 Kings uh, as well is the fulfillment of that there. There's a 350 year period between them. Uh, Daniel 11 is uh, a part of our midnight cry message. From 2013, when Ezra 7, 9 began to be understood, uh, being connected with Samuel Snow and the Millerite, uh, the Millerites. In 2014, then uh, the midnight, midnight, uh, midnight cry was then. Several, initially, it was just connected with midnight, and around that their time, it may have been early two or late 2013, and around that time, 2014, uh, midnight and the midnight cry. Where then we found out there's two way marks there. Around that there same time, Theodore recognized there was a 391 year and a half for the, the period of the kings of Judah. Uh, 2016, uh, Raphia and Panium were then opened up and that related to the events of the midnight cry and, the, and midnight. So we were able to put events connected with them. And in 2016 here uh, was uh, the prophecy of Josiah in uh, First Kings uh, 12 and 13 was then related to the 391 as well. And then in 2018, we have them prophecies, the two 391s of Josiah Litch and uh, the 391 of Ezekiel then being combined and projecting into 2020. We have the year 1838, Josiah Litch predicting the three, at the end of the 391s and 15 days prophecy uh, being fulfilled in the 1840. And we have this here in 2008, uh, we had this here in 2018 projecting it to occur in, in 2020. And, and Tahiti, Perminder himself, uh, done a presentation connecting 1840 to the year 2020. Uh, he pointed out to me, I asked him about, about these two prophecies uh, in Wales, and uh, he, he didn't seem to be against it. At the time, this was in June this year, and uh, he seemed to be quite reasonable. He, he maybe uh, he didn't really. He thought more the focus should be on the 9th of November, and didn't really sense to uh, had much of a message for this year time. Uh, but when it came to Germany, it just uh, he just it was like turned on its head. He repudiated it uh, any significance. Uh, it, there seemed to be as if there was a they were. Permender and Tess seem to be like, considering that there was like a conspiracy happening between um, myself and Adelio and Theodore, that we were trying to make them agree to this here passage. I, th I think uh, when I asked that question, 
Permender had the idea that I was trying to make him agree to Theodore's teaching. And uh, I was just uh, simply just trying to get answers. They have, have still yet to get an answer as to why this is fanaticism, why this is um, being rejected. Other than a line that Sister Tess has drawn, she, she has drawn a line uh, that has lined up Theodore with Simon the Sorcerer and the, the false prophet Bar Jesus in, in Cyprus. You know, and, and I, could, I, could draw a false I could draw a line up saying 2014, uh, you, you have a, a new leadership is hidden, but he rises Trump, he rises then to be a dictatorship. Um, I, could, I, could, uh, I could say, okay, that's the external, internal, 2014, you've a leadership, it's hidden, and it rises up to be a dictatorship. It has to be there, that's what she said. She said, the Watertown tent here, there has to be a midnight cry, a false midnight cry message, it has to be here as well. But it, I, I would like to sort of, that there line is not enough. You need to really, if you're going to be faithful and diligent students of prophecy, you need to look into what the actual midnight cry, false, what they call a false midnight cry message is. And it's just, there just seemed to be so much weight in this here line that Tess has been drawn that it doesn't, uh, they're not, they don't even seem to be considering all the evidence for this here. Um, it's, I was going to make just a relation to this here hook that um, has been cast into our time period uh, in 2014 with Ezra 7 9. You find that in, in 1844, uh, after the first disappointment on the first day of the first month, you have Habakkuk being part of the message of understanding that they are in the towering time. And then that's followed by the midnight cry of Ezra 7 9. And so that uh, ties in. To at the end of uh, March 2013, we have Ezra 7:9, and that's following a presentation of Habakkuk's two tables. So it's, it's paralleling. Um, you can see a parallel from 1844 uh, to 2012-2013 with Ezra 7:9, following um, an understanding of Habakkuk. Um, so I just, uh, if you wanted, maybe turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30 and we'll there's how many years between 1844 and 2012 is it 1st Sa First Samuel 30. 30. I will just focus on uh, verses 9 and 10. So what's happened is that uh, David has returned from the... He was going to fight... With Saul, uh, against Saul and with the Philistines and uh, the Philistine lords didn't want David to be part of the, the Philistine army and um, so they returned and, and they returned to Ziklag and when they returned to Ziklag David found that uh, the Amalekites had made off with a lot of their provision burned their, the town and took in their wives. And then there was this decision then afterwards. Uh, David inquired of the Lord in verse 8, Shall I pursue after this trip? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them. Without fail, recover all. So David went, he and 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, and those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. So David goes on to continue. He meets an Egyptian. He leads them to where the camp was of the Amalekites, and they, they then attack the Amalekite camp and recover all uh, that they had taken from them and 
in verse 21, we can continue to read, uh, and David, he, David then returns to Ziklag, uh, but on the way he meets um, those who, to, who couldn't continue. There was 200 there was, who stayed there, and while 400 went on to pursue the Amalekites, it says, and David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet, to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men, the men of Belial, of those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And it was, and it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. Uh, so the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm selecting this here passage, it came to mind uh, when I was considering the name of a, a presentation that Sister uh, that Tess made uh, in Australia. And the, the title was called They Had No Part in the Work. <clears throat> uh, she's, I believe that she's referring to FFA and the saying that the midnight cry message that FFA had no part in it. And, uh, but in reading this here passage, um, where uh, we get the idea that those who say that there was 200 people who, who didn't join in the battle because they were faint, <clears throat> and um, there was those, then those who went into the battle, uh, they're called... Um, men of Belial in verse 22 uh, they, they say they, they're saying that those who went with David said because they went not with us we will not give them aught of the spoil so they're basically saying they had no part in the work and um, we, David rebukes these it says, if the spirit of David I believe which is the spirit of Christ in this here passage is saying that even though uh, if, they, if they didn't have any part in the work, you know, if, if they helped in some other manner, they, they helped. You know, if, if, we're, if we're going to consider that the Midnight Cry message that Tess presented here last, um, last autumn, <coughs> that, uh, that it was like FFA had no part in the work, that is going against the spirit of, uh, of I believe, of David in this passage and of Christ. If Christ was here last uh, autumn presenting the Midnight Cry in person, he would say, Larry, you're part of the work. You're the cameraman. You know, Deborah, you're, you were part of the work. You helped prepare food, uh, providing uh, the cleaning of the place and, and whatever. Uh, that would be the, the spirit of, of Christ, I believe. Uh, but it's not, uh, I don't mean just to say that they had no part of the work. Uh, I, th I think is, is uh, representing a spirit which can be represented by these here men of Belial. And, um, but even if, but I don't believe it's even the case that even doctrinally that they, that there's FFA, I, I know for myself there's things which, uh, there's a thing, one thing anyway, at least I've added to their message that they consider that they're, they're still presenting as well, and I'm sure there's, there's maybe others from what they would consider to be the other side uh, that is included in their message as well. So just to say that we have no part in the work uh, is, uh, I believe, a, re a false representation of, uh, of what, has uh, what has taken place. <clears throat> um, so, and Yes, Larry. It calls them that do that in verse 
22 wicked. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, um, some, uh, one of the things that um, Tess said in Australia said, line upon line, we know exactly where we are, even in rebellion. Those who she calls separating from the movement are giving glory to God because they are fulfilling prophecy. I would say that they are fulfilling prophecy as well because they are rejecting the stone. And I, I do intend to give glory to God and fulfill the prophecy of Ezekiel in giving a 391-year prophecy that connects to the destruction of Jerusalem. <coughs> um, she also said that uh, she understood, she says that in 2018, she understood the role Theodore was playing and those following Theodore, if they had publicly had said what he is doing, people would not have understood. They would have seen Tess as like a troublemaker and that she, she says that she had to wait until the rebellion was open and then state it. She was um, sort of lining up this here rebellion. She yeah, she was comparing it to Lucifer, uh, that Christ or God had to wait until the rebellion was fully open before, she could, uh, before God had to sta state that uh, Lucifer's rebellion. So she was comparing uh, what myself or Theodore and whatever, she had to wait until the split with FFA had, had occurred before she could now say that we're at the Watertown tent, we're the false midnight cry. And I don't think she's actually honest in what she's saying here. Uh, it's certainly questionable because even in Germany, I had heard that uh, she had compared Theodore to Simon the Sorcerer and that uh, I was one of his disciples and um, sort of under his spell, so to speak. And uh, so, and that was before the split with FFA, uh, which, which was, so it was, it was being stated then before that. Um, if we turn to the, there's a, a document I made there, it should be available, called the, the Story of the 18th of July 2020 Study. And I was just going to read some passages concerning this here. Uh, you can read that, most of it, in your own time. Uh, some of it we've already covered since we've been here. Um, <clears throat> I'll just start off, I'll go to the section uh, called a summary. It's on page six. And we'll just read some passages from this. <clears throat> so having two 391-year prophecies with the name Josiah connected to each of them indicates that this is not chance and that they are some way connected together. The two prophecies line upon line offers a date that facilitates meaningfully both prophecies using two different calendars. The potential of this date being identified over a year and a half before its juncture or its, its fulfillment allowing the opportunity to explore further evidence and to share its possibilities. You know, this has just been opened up to us like just in time before its fulfillment, giving us time to, to, to study these things. It just seems like it's God's providence uh, in, in, the, in, in the timing of the, of the opening of this. So throughout the history of Christianity, the particulars of the 390 and 40 days of Ezekiel chapter 4 remained a mystery. In recent years, its understanding has been opened up to this movement. The studies of the autumn of 2018 offer us a reason as to why. So the understanding that Ezekiel had a significant, significant connection with Samuel Snow and the Midnight Cry message only began to be comprehended after the light of Ezra 7-9 had been opened up in March 2013. No other biblical character more exemplifies snow. Ezekiel begins his prophecy on the 21st of July and gives a prophecy with a number of ties to the 15th of August. 
both make a time prediction based upon a previous prophecy connected with the name Josiah. I believe God would have us understand that Ezekiel 4 has consequence with the soon coming midnight cry by Mark and is wedded to the woes of Revelation chapter 9 being the subject of Islam. Um, so this is a Going on to the next section, a brief history of the study from autumn 2018 to October 2019. A few months after the studies in Arkansas in the autumn of 2018, Elder Jeff Peppinger included the study in his presentations, but it met with resistance and eventually ceased to be communicated. However, no satisfactory, no satisfactory explanation as to why it was considered invalid was given to those who found the evidence of a compelling nature. To these, it seemed as if an aspect of the light of the midnight cry had been rashly denied. They sought to continue to, to consider and promote the study's findings. In 2018, this led to the leadership seeking to suppress the teaching, considering it fanatical and a false prophecy. No evidence was provided as to why it should be renounced at the time, but Tess Lambert has since produced a line that has Theodore Turner lined up with biblical events in Cyprus, implying that he is the anti-type of the figures of Elimus, Bar-Jesus and Simon the Sorcerer. She also connected Theodore to the fanatical Watertown tent at the Midnight Cry venue of Exeter. Within about three days of its suppression, there followed a shaking in the movement. About, after about a month, in October 2019, Elder Jeff again began to consider and teach its possibilities. And there's a quote there from Acts 5, 38-39. If this counsel or this work be of men, it will come of naught, but be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, least happily ye be found to even to fight against God. Um, the, so I just have some comments here as well. If I'll read. Um, if the 18th of July 2020 comes and goes without incident. Just so some thoughts here. The history of time setting is generally a litany of failure, disappointment and humiliation that should inspire one with caution when dates are proposed. Even Josiah Litch, whose prediction is deemed as having validity by this movement, is widely contested in the church. Litch himself was able to go on to abandon the year-day principle upon which his prediction was established. In the light of such a track record and numerous Ellen White quotes warning against time setting, we could be wise to dismiss the 18th of July 2020 study. However, if providence is opening the way for those who are constrained with the potential importance of this study and with opportunities to share it abroad, despite criticism and the risk of embarrassment, may do well to consider it the responsibility to do so. Greater would be the consequence to refuse those opportunities if a momentous event occurs on the 18th of July 2020. The study that evolved in the autumn of 2018 had the input and support of Elder Jeff as well as others in the class and those watching online. It involved developing an understanding of calendars, a subject Samuel Snow had also to come to understand. The subject was deemed as complementary or a second witness to the presentations of Tess Lambert rather than conflicting with or opposing her studies. There have been at times other spurious teachings uh, in the past uploaded on the School of the Prophets YouTube site that afterwards were removed. In contrast, the presentations of the July 18, 2020 study still remain uploaded. If the study is indeed fanatical as to how it is being portrayed by Tess, rather than a broad portrayal of fanaticism, can she be specific as to what aspect of the study is fanatical and why? Is it fanatical to believe that Ezekiel 4 has import concerning the midnight cry for our time? A Bible-based prophecy pregnant with midnight cry symbolism that is not currently part of her midnight cry message. Juxtaposed, she has the lives of non-biblical historical figures taking precedence over this biblical prophecy. Is it fanatical to say that the Bible provides us with a 391 and a half year time span for the reigns of the kings of southern kingdom of Judah? If not, is it fanatical to line those up with the 391 years, them 390 years, 391 years up with the 391 years of Revelation 9.15 and seek to make an application? 
Ultimately, time will tell if the potential insights gained from the study prove to be erroneous. If that turns out to be the case, the following extract from William Miller's Apology and Defence, page 34, may provide, um, provide applicable counsel. It says, I therefore still feel that it was my duty to present all the evidence that was apparent to my mind. And were I now in the same circumstances, I should be compelled to act as I have done. I should not, however, have done so had I seen the time would pass by. But knowing that it would, I would... Sorry? But sorry, but not knowing that it would, I feel now even more satisfaction in having warned my fellow men than I should feel. Were I conscious that I had believed them in danger and had not raised my voice, how keen would have been my regret had I refrained to present what in my soul I believed to be the truth and the result that proved that souls must perish through my neglect. I cannot therefore censure myself for having conscientiously performed what I believed to be my duty. Alternatively, if an event that the study advocates occurs on the 18th of July 2020, God willing, there will be a Peep, there, there will be, there will have been a people to fulfill, fulfill that role, typified by Ezekiel chapter four, and giving a prophecy that signified the destruction of Jerusalem at the midnight cry by Mark. Um, so um, I have um, some comparisons, like the test says that this is the Watertown tent uh, that occurred here in 2018. And um, with the Watertown tent, my, my understanding is that the Watertown tent was before Samuel Snow presented his message and the Midnight Cry message came and um, that dissipated it, the fanaticism. However, if you compare that to this study, if, if, if she was the Midnight Cry message presenting it, Samuel Snow. This here study then followed after that and it was complementary to her study. Um, it was not seen to be against it and it actually came as, as a result largely of, what, of her study. Uh, we connect it to 252 days uh, from the 9th of November to 2019. So there is some differences. Those in the class uh, were basically the same people uh, in the classes uh, that she had um, presented. So it was in a sense the same tent. Uh, the only difference was that she wasn't there. Uh, she had gone to France. Um, so as to what is fanatical, uh, other than her drawing a line just saying it's fanatical, I just, I'm looking at what actually occurred and how the, the study proceeded. The input of Jeff, others online, those in the class, um, as to how it was fanatical. Uh, I would like an answer as to how, what aspects of it is fanatical. Um, so, I've yeah, still yet. So, if anyone who's watching online, if they could have, if you, if you could, find, if you ever get an answer, uh, sort of let me know because I, I'd like to find out. <coughs> so, is anything, any other questions before we close? I have one comment that I disagree with you on. Yes. Um, early on, I, it popped in my mind, early on in your presentation, you suggested to them in Germany that your presentation of, of time was similar to Parminder's presentation in time, but instead of them laboring with you to show you why your presentation was erroneous, all they would say is recant, recant. So, I disagree with your parallel. I have email dialogues of my own, and I know of other email dialogues that were interacting with Parminder in 2012 and raising questions that he couldn't answer. In, in Tabo's email inter, interaction with him, he said plainly, I do not know how to get around the Ellen White quotes about time setting. So, at that point in time, he didn't even have a justification for time setting. I raised questions to him that he never did answer that were valid questions. One of them was, 
if you're saying there's a Sunday law in 2014 based upon the conclusion of a 126-year time prophecy, where was the Sunday law in 1888? There was no Sunday law in 1888, and I still contend there was no Sunday law in 2014. The only way he can justify a Sunday law in 2014 is taking the big line Sunday law and shrinking it into the priest line. But as we all know, he has now rejected the Sunday law and the big line, so he has no prophetic justification for even try trying to argue that there was a Sunday law in 2014. So my presentation at the camp meeting where I retired brought up that he was half right with the element of time and half wrong about the event. Mm -hmm. And this is what brought about such a vicious response from Tess. My point is, your comparison is not valid in the sense that there were people that labored with Parminder about his false prophecy in 2012, and he could not even justify why they were wrong. Whereas no one labored with you in Germany, and I contend they don't have the ability to show why you're wrong. So I get why you were making the parallel, but I want to make it clear for the audience, the parallel really breaks down when you look at it closely. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we'll close for prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks for your love for us and um, your help in helping to us to convey recent events uh, concerning the midnight cry and things that you've been opening up to us. Father, I just pray that they be established by you, that they are of you, and that you watch over your word to perform them. For may we be aligned with what you're asking us to do for the, this year time. May at our close of probation, may we be found acceptable in thy sight and without spot or blemish, that we may be pure vessels in your hand, Father, to, to do our work that it will conclude in the end of 6,000 years of sin. Father, just give thanks for the privilege of living at this year time in history, to be part of what you're doing in the earth at this year time. May, or, may your angels watch over us and guide us in all that we do and say. And uh, I pray your blessing upon those who, who have watched this presentation, that they may take heed and consider what the Permender and Tess have done in rejecting uh, clearly midnight cry passages, which is, um, which is loaded midnight cry symbolism of Ezekiel chapter 4 and, uh, and other passages, Father, that are all connected and uh, that they may consider that why they're not being addressed by Perminder and Tess and that they may uh, seek to agitate these things um, with, with them. I pray you help them and, and those who are seeking after truth that they may be found on the right side of the issue. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.